Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host Kirsten Nutz, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how to get from losing everything to becoming one of the most recognizable voices in the industry. So buckle up. Grab a cold one, let's shake it up with today's guest right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 148. But hang on, before we get into today's episode, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got some exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or unless I forget to put it in, it's somewhere down here on the screen. So welcome to episode 148. And in today's episode, we have another special guest. Give it up for the California-based award-winning wedding photographer, the founder of SLR Lounge, and one of the, really one of the most prolific educators on YouTube. Give it up for Mr. Pai Jersa. Pai, man, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. For coming on the show um when i said one of the most recognizable voices i wasn't kidding like you have one of the smoothest voices in the photography industry that i've ever heard well i appreciate that i've been known to teach and put quite a few people to sleep <laughs> at the same time <laughs> that's an experience that i think we share i spent many <laughs> years in the classroom <laughs> i think i had the same effect on people yeah, thanks for having me on, though. And I'll, if for anybody that's watching, I'm going to do my best just to look into the camera, but Kirsten's space is over here, so I like to look at him when he talks. So if you see me glance over here, that's why. But if you're just listening to audio, you won't even notice that. So, Pi, I've mentioned it um, in the intro. It's, I, I heard your story, and I was really, uh, you know, I was really uh, quite taken aback because I said, in the intro, I said, we're going to talk about what it's like to lose everything and then having to build your whole career up again. Uh, Just tell us a little bit about what that was like for you. Well, I, I guess I would ask which time, like it's kind of happened uh, at least to me two times in my career. So three, if I'm, if I'm being specific, but like the first time was leaving um, Ernst and Young. It was my, I was an accountant. And so it was kind of leaving everything that I'd studied as a CPA just to, to start over and be like, this isn't what I want to do. And, and I want to chase this kind of dream of photography. Um, the second time was after my divorce. So that was another point where like you literally bought them out, zero out, used every bit of savings that I had to buy back the ownership in, in my own companies and, uh, and start again, basically. So which time? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, I, the, the thing I can, identify with is um you know the the breakup of a relationship and then then having to literally start from scratch again because you know for me it was not too dissimilar i split up with my ex-partner like we weren't married but uh with you know an ex-partner of 14 years and we had, a, we had a child together and and um i at the time was running a company i was running a private music school and i sold it for one pound one british pound oh, crazy. Um, at the time yeah because yeah. for for me it was that thing I, I just, I had this epiphany and I just realized that I had to change my life completely and start completely afresh. And so I needed to get rid of that weight on my shoulders. And I just, yeah. rather than going through the whole process of selling a business and all that kind of thing, I just, you know, on a Friday, literally I decided I had to get rid of it. And by Monday I was rid of it. And, and my new life started right there, you know, in, in the photography industry, really. So that's wild. Yeah, I mean, specifically, I, I think um, a lot of times people struggle with, you know, the the idea of reinventing themselves because you feel like you're giving up a lot. Um, I don't know that I've struggled with it in the same sense because it always feels like I'm I'm giving up more by not pursuing something um, or staying somewhere that's you know unhealthy or whether it's a a career, whether it's a relationship, whatever it might be. So to me, the costs of um, doing something you don't want to do are always, they always outweigh. So it doesn't feel like 
doesn't feel like anything noble or even difficult at the time because it's like, well, it's easier to do that than to, to stay and just be miserable. Exactly. Now, you mentioned it earlier. You started out your uh, your career as an accountant for Ernest & Young. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. They're one of the big four accounting, or at least they were at the time, uh, one of the big four accounting firms. So usually when you get a job like that, it's difficult to get. And then once you're there, for most people, it kind of becomes like, like this is your career, like you've made it, you know. Um, for me, it felt the opposite. It felt like uh, I was going further and further away from who I was kind of thing. And when you stepped out of that, what what did that feel like for you? Um, I mean, there's there's definitely nerves, you know, like I, I stepped away. Each time I've kind of reinvented, um, I've fallen back on savings. And I, I have a, I do like to live well under my means at, at any point in my life, just so that I always have the freedom to, to make decisions like that. But at that point, my savings was, um, probably the, the worst it's ever been. Cause I was a college student or just graduated from college and, and working for Ernst for only two years. So maybe I had $20,000, which I think was to me was runway for like a, a year, maybe, um, living really frugally. And so. There was like the the pressure of of having to make money, um, but I think the more difficult part was probably the social pressure of like my dad said you know and and he's long since kind of changed his tune, but um, his first words were if I'd known that you were going to do this, I would have never helped pay for your college education. And so it was letting down the people around you like at, at the, I think they perceive it like you're a quitter, and and you are like I did quit, but it wasn't like to quit period. It was like, I want to quit and do something better. Uh, in in for me, you know, so that was probably the more difficult aspect of it. So did you know that you were going to go into photography right away or was that something that developed over time? No, we, we actually quit. Um, so I quit with two business partners and we quit to do a web-based startup. So that startup was, um, Back then, it was a competitor to Yahoo Answers, but like with a little bit more of a marketability. Like you could you could actually bring in sponsors and and do things like that. So we had funding for it, and then right after we quit Ernst and Young, the the big recession hit. So the two thousand eight recession um, really landed hard in two thousand nine, and our investors pulled the funding. So we kind of had this team of people that we put together, and we're like, "Hey guys, we're sorry, but." We lost our funding and, and we can't continue. And then uh, it was kind of just sitting there twiddling our thumbs. I went, I happened to go to a wedding like the following week uh, for a friend of mine. I was in the wedding party and a photographer there was taking the pictures. And I asked him, like, I'm just curious, like, how much do you get paid to go and photograph weddings? And uh, I think he said like 1500 bucks or 2000 bucks. And and he was he was bragging about it, and I was like, "Whoa, that's a ton of money! Like, I can't believe you get like two thousand bucks for." And people are probably laughing because that's not that much, you know, in the world of weddings. But to me, it was a ton of money. And um, and he's like, "Yeah, it's not bad for a day's work." And and like, he was kind of new to it too, I'm sure, because you definitely find out later that it's not a day's work. But um, <laughs> but anyway, that kind of got me interested. And then I went to WPPI the conference in 2009, and. Uh, I, I didn't even own a camera. So Kirsten, I'm just sitting there like trying to figure out like, do I want to do this for a living and convince my partners that this is what we should do too. Um, so I couldn't tell the difference between like a good photograph versus a great photograph versus an average photograph. Like everybody I was, I would sit in these, uh, auditoriums when these lectures would go up on stage and I'm like, that's cool. Like these people get a lecture to all these, you know, artists and photographers. And then I'd ask the people sitting next to me, like, show me your work, show me your work. And one after another, their work was incredible. I was just like, man, you guys are so good at this. You guys are so good at this. I was trying to figure out what the pattern was. And what I came home with was that I still didn't know a good photograph to save my life, but I came home with, um, when I told, told, talked to Justin and Chris, I, th I said, I think there's an opportunity here because what I recognized was that everybody that went on stage understood business. Everybody that was in the audience understood photography. So. I told us and Chris, we don't know photography, but I'm pretty sure we can learn that side. We do know business. And I think that's going to help us to kind of thrive. So we actually decided to do it. We didn't even own a camera. We didn't, you know, nothing. We just kind of decided to do it as a business and then sort of 
fell in love with it as we did it. So you get a real advantage um, to a lot of other people because I think it's probably true to say that the vast majority of creatives struggle with the business side of things. But you can attack yes. it the other way around in, in, in a way. Yeah, I think that was definitely key to kind of like our... Like at the at the very, very beginning, it was a hindrance, right? Because at the very, very beginning, we didn't know how to create a good photograph. So for the first few months, it was stressful and challenging and, and like, how do we even create a good product? But then after that, the business side took over. And so we were maybe two years into our business when we were hiring our first staff. We had, I think, three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000 of revenue within two years. Um, and then by year three, we broke seven figures. And by year four, and it was like, okay, we can actually do this and and build something successful. And, and what we realized, it was we were approaching it completely different than an artist would. We approached it from the standpoint of like, I want to say like an artist has like a certain set of codes that they live by, like to their own artwork. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's it's like, it's it's what drives them. And, and most certainly you should stick to that if that's what you believe. But we didn't have that. Our code was keeping the clients happy. So we did basically whatever it took to make our clients happy. And we made things simple and easy. And, and we tried to reduce as much friction in this experience as possible. And so it made it really easy because we serve clients in a way that nobody was doing at that time. Um, and I, I think that really changed how we were able to enter and, and make an impact within a few years. So give me some specific examples of what you did differently uh, to the competition, for instance, at the time. Well, like a, a huge difference is just the sales process. Like the, the way that a typical photographer would sell their work is by talking about their work. Like, you know, we, you sit down, I'm going to show you my albums. I'm going to talk about what makes me different. And I'm going to talk about, you know, this is the kind of cameras that I use. And, and I achieve this by, you know, photographing at a very wide aperture. And, and I do this to get this look and this is how I light. And what makes me unique is the way that I light. Well, we take it from like a, a business and sales standpoint, which is like, I'm only going to talk to you about photography. If you want to talk about photography. Like we're going to, I'm going to sit you down and ask questions like, well, what are the things that you value in this experience? Why are you here? Like, what are you looking for? And so we design a process around that and we called this the, the wave and the wave would be a process that we could then. So that kind of became my job is over the course of like, once we were two years into it, we had to start teaching our teams how to do things. And I'm like, I'm, I, I get kind of tired of saying the same thing over and over. So why don't I just create education around it? And that was kind of where SR Lounge was born, was from that process of creating our own education. So I'd make a process for sales so that anybody coming in could basically replicate what we were doing in our sales meetings, like the partners. Um, and that became the wave. But it's basically the wave is, let's talk about what you value, not about my photography. It's let's make you the client, the hero, not me, your photographer. I'm, I'm Yoda, I'm the assistant. I'm the person that's gonna help you to achieve whatever it is that you wanna get. Um, as opposed to like, I'm the one, I'm, I'm not Luke Skywalker, you are. So the way was about creating that process that someone else could replicate in a sales meeting. So you, And then we you, just did that across the board. So you're basically the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi to somebody else's Luke Skywalker. Yeah. It's, it's being comfortable, like taking that, that Obi-Wan mentor role, that the guide role, as opposed to like, I need everything to be about me. Artists have a tendency to kind of um, and, and, it, and it's unfortunate because like, if the clients are hiring you for their wedding, it's their day, it's their, you know, it's their family shoot, it's their, whatever it is, it's for them. But a lot of times our egos kind of takes a, takes hold and it's kind of like, well, we make the day about us. You know, I need to have this and to be able to do my job. I, and, and you hear all these horror stories of, especially back then, I think photographers have gotten a lot better in general. Um, but back then we'd hear all these horror stories of like, photographers demanding a one hour break and, and they're not going to work if they don't get food and they're, and this kind of stuff still happens today. But like by and large, it's like, no, we bring our protein bars. Like we're good. Like if, if there's not an opportunity to sit down, we're fine. Like we we understand that we're paid to do a job and we're here to do that job. And, and so that approach kind of won clients over. And if you win clients over, um, I think you're good. Like we were, 
and it and it's funny too because that ego thing I think plays a big role in uh, you know the the aspect of being award winning. Like we were serving our clients long before we were award winning, and we only submitted to the awards that we could actually show off in front of our clients to say, "Hey, look, you're making a good choice when you hire us." But the awards that we were going for is never like, let's let's be we don't care about being known to other photographers. We care about anything that we can basically put in front of our clients to make them more comfortable. Um, but I think that's another trap that we fall into as we become yeah. photographers who are creating art for the sake of other photographers. I think, you know, what you, what you said about um, the award winning aspect of it and turning into awards, it does, from a marketing point of view, I think it, it works well because it's sort of, it plays on the um, authority bias. You know, Absolutely. You're, you're putting yourself into the expert position, you know, and you the confirmation is the award-winning part of it. So it works It works well for clients, but I'm guessing it's like you said, it doesn't really make any difference to the way that you operate per se. No, and and that's only one aspect of that, like, you know, kind of authority, right, is is the awards that you might receive. Another aspect is like just as good in, in, our, in our books, a better award is a thank you card or a five-star review. It's just a matter of like, do you actually feature those things in your business? Do you actually show those off? So, so we would show those things off. Like when you walk into our studios, there's a wall, you have to pass through this hallway and on both sides of the hallway is just lined with thank you cards. So like that means a lot more from the standpoint of a client than you having award winning on your website. Everybody can be an award winning photographer, right? And so that's one piece of authority that you can use in the process. But it's one of many. And a lot of times we get lost in that. The ego gets us lost in those things as opposed to like, yeah, there's a huge impact, a much bigger impact of walking through a hallway of, you know, thank you cards as opposed to just seeing five star re or just seeing award winning on your website. So what would you say are like your, so your top three sort of mistakes that photographers make in business um, if you had to sort of think of like the, the three biggest mistakes you could think of? Goodness. Top three mistakes. So I would probably say number one, the the highest mistake that I think a photographer can make that most will fall into, and and including ourselves, you know, like like it's not to say that we didn't make these mistakes either getting into this. It's just anytime you make the process about yourself, right? Anytime you're talking about just like what we talked about in the sales process, anytime you're talking about your features, we call it feature selling. So when you're selling the features of something, you're making a huge mistake because that's an opportunity that you have, that you have someone's time, you have their their attention, and you can be talking about what you, they value and how you're going to deliver on the things that they value. And instead, you're talking about why you do what you do. Um, so so that's a huge mistake. And, and I would say the same thing carries through to any part of the process that isn't like client-centric. Um, I would say the second big mistake that photographers make is... Uh, they don't properly automate and treat their business like a business. So like every tool that we've created, as for allowed was the first um, offshoot business that we created. It was all the education that we needed to train our own team. We then made it available to others and we developed a platform and um, you know, it has over half a million visitors a month just on this platform. And we have thousands of students around the world. This was our second seven figure business was teaching people how to create their first seven figure business. And um, that I think comes from just having a mind to anything that I'm doing repeatedly, I'm going to create a system for. So for me, it was education. But then there's other things too, like, like, well, what about, you know, the email responses that you're getting often? Like, do we put together an FAQ? Do we reference people to the same blogs? Do we create automated email systems? Um, one of our newer uh, software developments now is is AI development. So we developed a, a company called Impossible Things. And now it's basically taking our, our methodology of editing in Lightroom and now it's fully AI adapted. So it incorporates lighting conditions and camera profiles, but it does all of your color grading for you. So we're always looking for areas of the business that we can say, can we, at step one is, can we put in place a standard operating procedure or, or an SOP? Step two, could we automate this even further? Like, can we can we go beyond just having someone do this? Could we find a piece of software or even create something that would do this for us? So that would be the second piece is like kind of buying back your time from the business uh, through automation. And then maybe the 
the the third piece is where your time goes. Um, I think artists in general, time management is not one of our greatest skills. And and oftentimes, like you'll find that a lot of artists will actually have ADHD. So I have ADHD as well, and it's it's both kind of a superpower and it's also kind of a something that that can hold us back, right? In terms of scheduling and and staying on task, it can be difficult. But once you're on task, it can become kind of the superpower because you get a focus like nobody else's business. But the key to that is like really good time management using like things like a Pomodoro, tracking your time. I'm going to put time here and and kind of working around all the things where we're naturally weak, um, I, I would say is the the other big factor. And treating it like like just because you can work from home, just because this is your business doesn't mean that it's not something that you should treat seriously. Like you should put 40 plus hours a week into this, you know, and, and be serious about the business. You know, I struggle with similar things. Like, uh, you know, I've, I've just um, recently uh, started applying a technique of time blocking, you know, which, yes. which seems to work really quite well for me at the moment. So I've, I've tried all sorts of different things to manage my time um, because it's, you know, it's, it's exactly like you explained, my attention just goes very quickly, you know, or, I forever stay on the same task, you know, yeah. which in my former life I used to be a studio musician. And so, you know, um, so I was a guitarist, I'm still a guitarist really, cause you never, you never forget how to play the guitar. But, um, but that was, you know, that's, that's what I did. And, um, it, you know, it does take a lot of dedication and focus to get to that playing level, you know, as a musician. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the sense I mean, for me, you know, when I, when I changed my career from music to photography that ability to to stay on task and to focus really hard on something and spend a lot of time to the exclusion of all sorts of other things rightly or yeah. wrongly um that did help me to um you know to hone my skills in, in photography for, for me actually it was it was sort of an easy in a way it was an easy field to fall back into because i'm, I'm sort of a, I'm a third generation photographer it's been you know photography's been in the family since my grandparents essentially and so it was like, it was an easy fallback. It was always there, you know, it was, it was just, uh, it was just cha channeling creativity visually rather than sonically. Yeah. If that makes sense. So it's a relatively easy thing, but you know, the business aspect of it, um, that was for me, I had to learn it on the job, you know, is, uh, I, you know, I used to, I used to teach at an agent and, um, and I used to teach and before I knew it, my timetable was full. And I couldn't really book in any more students. And then, of course, he, you're faced with a decision: either you raise prices, you know, prices, and you, you lose a whole bunch of people, and therefore you gain, you, you have time to, to gain, um, to increase your profits and whatever. Or I thought, like, oh, well, you know, I can get other people to teach for me. And at that point, the idea, you know, once you go like, well, okay, I can hire another guitar teacher to teach the students that I can't teach, or but if I can do that, then I can hire a drum teacher or a vocal teacher or whatever. And before yeah. you know it, you're looking at a school kind of setup. And that's exactly what I ran for about 12 years. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that's a great way to, that's kind of how every creative business goes, right? You can either increase revenue by prices or you can increase revenue by training people to do what you do. And either way, it, it, it kind of takes you to the same place with different models of business. Um, and it's kind of about choosing which, which one's right for you. Exactly. And I found in the beginning, you know, I found learning the business side of, uh, you know, any creative endeavor in, in this, in this instance, music, that's where I found the hard part. And I literally had to, I had to learn through mistakes. You know, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes. And every time, you know, I looked at it and I went, okay, cool. Well, that didn't work out very well. Yeah. <laughs> You know, let's figure out why that didn't go very well and uh, do something else next time. Like those are the, I, I feel like those mistakes are the best teaching moments. Like, I don't know, you can only, you can only learn so much from success, right? But there is so much to be learned in, in each mistake, each failure. Absolutely. That's why I always say, I always say to students, you know, to embrace failure because those are the moments when, you know, you're learning experience is really the greatest, you know, because, mm -hmm. because if you take that time to backwards engineer why things have gone wrong and to figure out what, you know, what happened and why it's gone wrong, then that's the best learning experience you can ever have. And it's relatively easy to understand as well for me anyway, it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great concept. I, I feel like the, the struggle that people often have is that they don't 
recognize where they failed. Like they, they don't take ownership over their failure. So like, it's easy when, when something, you know, like when, if you're playing a one-on-one sport, for example, and you lose, then it's very clear and easy to see that that was my fault. It was, there was no one else there to blame. Right. But in a lot of things that we do in life, it's, it's not necessarily like it's, it's easy for us to actually find someone else, something else to blame. And then that completely kills the process of failing and learning from the mistake. You, you just end up repeating the same mistake over and over. So you can believe that yes, failure is important. You can believe that, you know, I should learn from mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes yet be incapable of doing it because you can't recognize it when it happens. Yes. Or you can't recognize that, you know, that just you when something goes wrong, it's not necessarily always somebody else's fault. You know, sometimes it, it just, exactly. you know, you just need to be honest with yourself and like, well, okay, this is where I screwed up a thing. <laughs> Let's not do that again. Exactly. Let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. DVE Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thank you to DVE Store for the high def video. And of course, you can find a link to DVE Store in the description. So what advice would you give somebody who is uh, maybe at the verge of going pro or maybe thinking about going pro and and they're just, you know, facing that, you know, that, that unknown. What advice would you give somebody who's at that point in their career? Hmm. So I approach everything very much from like a, a, a psychology lens. My, my background, um, I've been studying psychology informally for well over two decades now. And so my new, um, my, my latest venture is actually a psychology platform with a, a doctor of psychology. Um, so you'll probably notice, I say this because you'll probably notice that like everything that I say advice wise or like thoughts wise is very much based on the psychology of something as opposed to like the passion of something or like, just go out and do it. Like, you know, um, so as for when is the right time to go full-time, is that essentially what you're asking is like, when, when should I make this transition to photography as a career as opposed to a hobby? Yeah, exactly. So I said, you know, is it something, as you said, is it something that we should just, you know, burn, that's just a, just a uh, way of thinking um, of like burning the boats, you know, you just simply burn the boats and you go for it and that's it, you know, there's no way back and the only way is forward. And that's, you know, that's sort of a, um, What's the word? It's like an emotional, emotionally driven way of thinking, I guess. But yes. then there's the preparatory way of, of thinking. So I, I would say like, it's really about sitting down to actually process what that would look like. You know, photography as a hobby is you picking up the camera when you want, shooting what you want. Um, deciding like, okay, well, I want to process it this way. I want to edit. It's a, it's meditative, right? It's, it's something that you do for enjoyment. Photography is a career is well, Monday through Friday, I'm going to be answering emails. I'm developing a website. I'm creating content around this platform. I'm working full time. I no longer, this isn't like a choice or when I get to, when I want to do this thing, it's, I, I, I gotta be doing this thing. And then guess what, depending on what type of photographer you are, then you know, once a week, maybe twice a week, sometimes weekdays, sometimes weekends, depending on like, if you're doing weddings or portraits, then you pick up the camera and you go create. But even when you're creating, you're not really doing it for yourself anymore. You're doing it for others, whether it's a commercial client, whether it's a, a photography portrait client, you're creating for them and making sure that they have a good experience. It's not so much about your experience anymore. And so it becomes something completely different than what it is as a hobby. And I would say that whenever you're taking on any venture, it's sitting down and actually visualizing what that thing would look like as a career, as opposed to what it looks like as just a hobby. Because what I often see is people go into it with the passion and I'm just going to burn the boats and I'm just going to make this thing work. Well, what you loved about that very thing is gone almost instantly. And the thing that you were using to meditate, to sustain yourself from an emotional standpoint is gone now. And so what do you have to support you? At this point, what do you have to bring your emotional energy up when you've given that thing up to pursue a business with it? 
So this is why I think the majority of, you know, we only have a, a four or five year, it's on average, the the burnout in our industry is every four to five years. So on average, a person is going to churn out within four to five years. Um, and this is because creative burnout, because you were using this thing to sustain your emotional energy. You turned it into your business and thought that it would continue doing that, but it doesn't. And so eventually you just reach creative burnout. So that would be my, my, my thought towards it. And like, I have a lot of things that sustain me emotionally. I, I, I love jujitsu. I mean, I spend all my time when I'm, when I'm not with my family, when I'm not working, I'm usually either at the gym or drilling jujitsu and I'm not exceptionally good. I'm just a lowly blue belt, but that's what I love doing. But I would hate doing that as a career. Not, not to mention the fact that I'm too old. Let's get past, I'm too old and, I, and, and I'm not athletic enough to do this as a career, but just as a career, everything that I love about it, jujitsu is my, my happy place. It's where I go to meditate. It's where I get my exercise. It's where, but if you force me to be in that gym eight hours a day to be training, to be like an elite athlete, I would be miserable. That's not, that's not who I am or what I am. So it's understanding that like, it's okay to like photography to buy a spe- expensive gear and to treat it like a hobby like it's your hobby it's that's your place it's okay to spend money and not make money on something if it's what sustains you and i think that's the big thing is that for some reason we're all stuck in this idea that i gotta make every one of my hobbies by profession and it's just not true like it it's not true at all like that would be the first thing that i would kind of give up in this thought process and really start to visualize whether it's actually right for you career-wise definitely reminds me i remember you know when um when I went to music college and and I then you know I started working in the music industry and I remember you know I I grew up in the south of Germany and every time I I traveled back and I meet friends, you know I'd always hear the same thing. It was like oh man it must be so great you know, um like to turn your hobby into your job, and I my answer always used to be like well I mean you just got something but you got to remember that once that's happened you have lost a hobby. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and and it's it's very difficult to to uh, maintain that balance because you got to find something else to do. You know, for me, that was, that was definitely the case. You know, I remember like when I was a kid, I was basically playing the guitar eight, nine, 10 hours a day. And that was it. You know, that's all I did. I loved doing it. But when, you know, when it becomes your job and all of a sudden it's like, okay, well now I can't play what I want to play. Now I've got to play what if somebody else pays me to play. And I mean, exactly. not, you know, I mean, not necessarily like it, but I just have to do it. Then th- those are the, those are the downsides of it, you know, yeah. and finding you know finding another outlet to create that balance is um is extremely important so i'm kind of against the burning the ships philosophy yeah absolutely no i totally agree um so when when you first got into when you first set up slr heart um you said your your the, the idea behind it was to essentially take the educational content that you created for your for your staff um and uh, create a, a digital platform for that Mm -hmm. and so how did that develop over time because then slr hub became more than just yeah you mean slr lounge slr lounge sorry wasn't it yeah when we created that um you know at first it was just editing tutorials so basically what i was teaching our staff at the time was just how to edit and so it was just free editing tutorials on youtube we would have editing tutorials on the website and um and that was really it. It was like raw processing and, 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 and whatnot. And then it kind of became, well, now we're getting a significant following doing this. And the next thing that I need to teach the team is, is, is this thing. So it went through a series of like these different steps of, I was creating these different little courses and I did an HDR course and all these different things. And then, and then it was like, well, why not just keep teaching what our team needs to learn? So we did the engagement photography course. And we gave it to our team and then all of a sudden, like our audience loved it and it became like the first thing that they bought. So we thought, okay, well, let's keep creating courses around basically developing the team. And it became this A to Z library where you could basically go from picking up a camera to if you wanted to, you could, it could be your full-time business. Like it's, there's, there's a seven series course, uh, program on, on wedding photography. There's, uh, a, a four part course on, um, lighting. You know, there's editing, everything in between. There's a, a, another four part workshop series on business. So it's basically each of these different things in, in modules that are available through the program where you can go, okay, I just want to fo- like focus on the art. 
So I'm going to go from photography 101 to lighting 401, do all the editing courses. And now I have this, I, I'm a great artist as a photographer. And then it's, well, I want to focus on photography from a, a, a wedding and portrait standpoint. There's a whole series on that. So you kind of, it honestly became too much in terms of like, like if I were to build the business now, I would actually approach it very different. It would be very much like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one skill and one thing. Um, whereas right now it's kind of like, you're going to learn photography, you're going to learn lighting, you're going to learn editing, you're going to learn, you know, business, you're going to learn wedding and portrait. It's, it's this massive library, uh, which is cool in and of itself, but it's a, uh, it's kind of a university, you know, doctorate degree in photography, all wrapped up into this little membership. It's, it's, it's one of the aspects I've always loved about um, things like SLR Lounge and, you know, things like Creative Light, for example, where, you know, you can dive in depending on where, you, where your interest is at that point. I found that extremely useful, especially when, you know, it came to, um, you know, turning turning photography into a business, because that's that's the thing I've always loved about SLR Lounge is that, you know, you can approach it from a creative point of view, but you can also then look at the business aspects of it. Yes. Yes. And there's there's a lot on every side. Like that's kind of what, like I would say more than anything for me, um, and this took a decade of doing things just to figure out for myself, but it, it was eventually getting to the point where I realized like, I'm not a photographer. I'm an educator. Like I, what I like doing is learning, creating systems around the things that I'm learning and then helping other people to master those things. Um, but first kind of learning it and doing it for myself. Um, but that was kind of like that it evolved into that understanding, like through the process of doing it, because I realized that I don't just want to shoot and take, like we had opportunities to go into commercial photography and other, you know, areas like do celebrity photography and then I realized like what excited me about this was the building of the process and the frameworks and, and the business around this, not necessarily the, the outlet of just taking a photograph. Like it's cool. It's fun. I enjoy it. But that wasn't what was driving me from like a, I guess from a, like a standpoint of like emotional need, you know, like what, what I needed was growth. Um, and that's what I was using each of these different ventures for. So really, it was interesting, you know, talk to you about about your thought process, um, because you know, when you at the very beginning, when you said, you know, uh, would ask you like, what was it like uh, to start all over again? You said, well, which time? It just yeah. seems like that's you know, that is just like your modus operandi is is essentially just to you know to to uh, create those systems and then move on, you know, and build build yeah. the next thing. So what's the next thing for you? So we launched, um, we launched a couple of things. So impossible things is our AI platform. That's probably going to be the last photography specific project that we, that we launch. Um, and that one's like basically Lightroom classic. It's a, it's a plugin that works directly with it and it lets you process thousands of raw files and whatever preset, whatever style you want, um, with in like 0.2 seconds per image, like you just run batches. So for for wedding event portrait photographers, it's kind of like a dream, like, like, and it's inexpensive. So it brings the cost of, you know, an editor that might've been 40, $50,000 full time a year down to like, say three, $4,000 on, on a yearly basis. So it's like one tenth the cost. Um, and editors, you need to move on to other things because AI is going to be taking every one of these technical tools, any technical trade that you have, <laughs> AI will be replacing. Um, and then the other sides, so we started up a, a platform last year in the space of uh, relationship psychology. So I'd been studying this for 20 years, about five years ago, and I take the things that cause me the most pain and I develop education around it. And it's first for me, and then it's like, well, do I wanna make this available to others? And and oftentimes I do. And so I, having gone, like I was in a, in a bad, marriage for 14 years before I kind of woke up and, and realized it. And through the whole time I was reading books and doing therapy and, and eventually got through the other side. And that was my second reset was in the divorce process. If you own a business and your spouse, um, is not working at the time, you basically lose everything because your spouse will automatically own. And it doesn't matter what happened in the marriage. It doesn't matter anything, especially if you're in like a no fault state like California. It's just everything is divided. If you have a business, they own half of it. So you have to buy out their half. So the, the second reset for me was losing all my savings, everything that I'd earned just to buy back. They place a valuation on the business, 
which is usually some crazy number that you can never sell it for. And then you have to basically buy your own business back with all of your savings and, and, or even take out loans to do that. So that was the second time that I was in my apartment, um, you know, like my one bedroom apartment, uh, zero in the savings account, didn't even have any furniture and start over again. But each time I started over, like you're not necessarily starting over because you have the knowledge that you gained. You have like, you know, like you're starting over in some ways, but it's important to recognize like every time. And I think that's a big part of it. Anytime you reinvent yourself, it's not starting from zero. It's starting from your knowledge base. Yeah, and so nobody, nobody can take the experience away from you. Exactly. Never. So that wasn't, you know, I was in an emotionally good place and I'm like, I can build back the wealth very quickly. And it took me, I don't know, a three, four years to be able to build a, a buy a home again and, and be able to support both households, um, and, and to be in a much better space. Last year, I started over again in a completely different field. So nobody knows me while well, I've been studying psychology for 20 years. Nobody knows me in the, in, in the psychology space. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a, a trained clinician. And, uh, I, meantime, when my divorce was happening, I was like, you know what? Oh, this is one thing curse. I didn't tell you. So for 10 years of photographing weddings, I thought maybe these weddings can give me the clue to like what's going on in my own marriage. And it's one of the reasons that I really enjoyed doing it. So every shoot, every client, everything that I did, I would just take notes when I'd get home. So I would document notes into a spreadsheet. And after uh, 10 years of doing that, I had over 500 of these observational case studies and they weren't like, I wasn't writing anything specific. It wasn't like, uh, you know, personal details. It was like, okay, during the shoot, um, I noticed on this engagement shoot that the man was walking in front of her the entire time and he wouldn't check in on his partner. Like generally, you know, if a, a sign of a healthy sense of regard for somebody, you'd look back just to see that they're okay. But this man didn't look back at all during a three hour shoot, um, nor did he check in with her verbally, nor did he, you know, seek her out in any of these moments where there was an opportunity to do so, it was actually her seeking him. So I'd write those things down. And after 500 of these, I had this, this gigantic data sheet. And so when the last counselor I met with, I, I'd met with over, you know, 30 counselors and, and therapists in this time. And it was so insane to me that these were all college graduates. They were masters or doctors. And yet every one of them approached the psychology of relationships from a different standpoint. And I was like, how is this possible that all of you are doing something completely different and yet you're all calling it therapy? Some of the time it's like the same kind of advice you'd get from a friend, but they have plaques on their wall. So, um, the last counselor I met with was like, uh, Pi, you've read every book on my shelf. I don't know how to help you in your marriage. Um, give me some time to research, but I, I don't know. And I left thinking like, like it kind of just shut me up. And I was like, I, what do you do now? So when I was driving home, it was like, well, I think I've come to a place where I can finally accept that this isn't something that I can fix. My marriage isn't something I can fix. And on top of that, I think I can actually put together a framework on this. I've been building frameworks in education for a long time. So I, over the course of five years, I wrote this book. And then in 2020, when you were creating your podcast, um, I had this book in my hands that I was like, okay, now it's time to publish it. And I'm like, nobody's going to want to publish this. I'm a, I'm a wedding photographer. To everybody else's view, I'm a wedding photographer with no business in this space. So sure enough, like one after another, people were shutting their doors on me. And I eventually found a, a, a doctor of psychology who's a professor and he had 20 years of experience on the clinical side. And he lived a few doors down from me. And so I gave him the manuscript and I was like, Dr. Glenn, just, I, I just have one favor, prove it wrong. That's it. Just, just prove it wrong. And I go, oh yeah. And my thesis for this entire book is that all relationships follow the same fundamental principles. And he looked at me like I was batshit crazy. And then, uh, he took the manuscript. He called me three days later and he's like, it incorporates every model. It's accurate. I can't prove it wrong. Let's create a business around this. And so we, we took some time he took it through clinical trials and, and kind of began doing like the, the, the work on it to figure out like what this would look like. And then six months later, we started that platform. So that became 12 big relationships. Um, and then our new spaces were kind of, I, I want to push into like broad audience education. So the relationship platform is one. And then we just started a marketing platform where people can learn how to create um, good viral content, content that like organically markets something that you want to promote. 
So it's a marketing platform. So that's kind of what it, I'm focusing on now is, is um, continuing what we're doing in the photo space, but then pushing out to broad audience education. Fantastic. And what um, attracts me to, to marketing side is actually the psychology behind it. Yeah. Um, so, so that's something you, you know, very... That's something I've been very interested in, um, especially, you know, um, social behavior science and, you know, human biases. And so it's been something yeah. that's, uh, that I find intrinsically um, interesting. Totally. Behavioral sciences and, and psychology. It's, and funny enough, like people that have gone through our programs, like on SR Lounge, there's a lot of psychology built into it. Because as I was studying it on my own, I was like incorporating it into the wave, the sales process is, is completely a psychological process of how to put somebody into the limbic system of thought, because you're selling an emotional product. Photography is a luxury and it's an emotional luxury. You're not going out as a rational human being like, I need photography in my life. And yet so often we approach the sales process from a logical standpoint. We think neocortex thinking of like, well, tell me what your wedding day timeline looks like, or what are you looking for in your photographs? those kind of questions immediately put someone into the neocortex where they want to rationalize and they want to think through things. They want time to process, to be able to logic. And then we turn around and we say, okay, it's going to be $6,000 for this. And we wonder why they have a problem with that. We wonder why they want to bargain. We wonder why, you know, they ask for time because you put them there, you place them in that mindset psychologically where they're now trying to buy an emotional project, uh, product from a rational standpoint, like from a rational minded view. And it's, it's crazy. So like the whole wave is designed to look, you're selling an emotional product. Let's put them into the limbic system and let's keep them there. Because when you look at a photograph, you're not thinking of your, it's not your neocortex firing up. It's your limbic system. It's the emotional, what you felt in that moment when you look at that photograph. So why would you sell it any other way? So there's a ton of psychology throughout our entire program that uh, that we build into every single concept from from directing a client from the camera to understanding like what it is someone values and sees in a photograph to how do you sell the product, how do you build a successful business, all of it. So what would be um, like a few tips that you could give um, you know photographers in the sales process to uh, to apply some of those techniques? Well, that was the, the first one would be like the asking value centered questions, right? Like it would be questions, not like, like when we sit down and talk, the first thing that we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to work to build a rapport. If this is done over the phone, you have to do it very quickly because over the phone, nobody wants to like, like if you say, how are you doing today? It's like, dude, get through it. And, and this is actually a, an instinctual response. So on the phone, it's very much, um, like we talk about like the, the base brain response, like the amygdala is is the part that processes instinctual response. So when I pick up a phone and I don't know who it is and, and whatever, that thing is firing like crazy. I don't want to waste my time with a telemarketer. I don't want to do this. It's all designed to help us preserve emotional energy. So on the phone, I need to get quickly to it and say like, Hey, I'm just calling you back. You left a message on our, on our website. My name is Pi. I'm one of the owners of lineages of photography. Um, I know this might not be a good time, but I'd love to talk to you about your wedding. And they might say, oh yeah, I did leave that note. And, and, um, you know, can we chat about it this time? And I go, yeah, you know what? I have a 15 minute window tomorrow at 2 45 PM. So I'll actually give them designated windows of like when, cause if I say, um, are you free tomorrow? That makes it seem like my time's not valuable. And it kind of gives them all the power and the dynamic, right? So on the phone, it's let's, let's find a time that works for you. And if they say they can't do that time, then I would say my next opening is Wednesday at, at 4 15 PM. So that way they're not like anytime that someone doesn't value your time, they're likely going to miss the call. They're likely not going to pay attention. Um, and so we kind of like, we'll do little things like that to make sure that we maintain that, but that's in a phone dynamic in an in-person dynamic. I want to start building rapport. So we're not even going to talk about photography. I'm going to ask them questions like, how did you guys meet? Tell me about your story, questions that would help me as a photographer to better understand and better relate to them so I can create a better product for them. And then it's going to be, okay, so, well, you guys are here. What would you value most in terms of like, I don't want to know about the photography style, nothing like that. I want to know specifically on the wedding day, what is the one thing that you're looking forward to most? And then listening to how they would answer that question. 
So the wave is about asking the right questions and it actually follows a, it's called the wall art visualization exercise. And so it uses a psychological process of asking the right questions to get them to a place where they're in a limbic response. Then you can mirror those things back to them and you can literally spell out what they value. You can, you can know as a photographer what images you'll be creating for them before you ever even touch the camera. And that's the beauty of it is once you do it right, not only does it help you to be a better salesperson, like as a value added service, but it helps you be a better photographer because now you know exactly what they value and what they would want captured. I'm really looking forward to your marketing course. <laughs> your marketing platform, brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, there's, there's another thing that I've learned about your past uh, that I find that I found really intriguing because apparently, um, according to my research, you have a degree in Chinese linguistics. Yeah, that was one of them. <laughs> I have a degree in in business accounting, and I have a degree in Chinese linguistics. I speak Cantonese and Mandarin, so that was kind of a to to be eligible for the CPA, you have to either have a master's degree or a master's equivalent in terms of credits. So I chose two majors. So that got me to the, the, the 150 credits that I needed. Excellent. Well, Chinese, well, Chinese linguistics is, is um, you know, sometimes the most common degree to pick, I suppose. But Well, so I spoke Cantonese and Mandarin from before that. So I, I used to be Mormon and I went on a two year service mission when I was 19. And I learned Cantonese and then I learned Mandarin. So when I got to college, I was like, okay, these will be, this will be an easy way for me to get the credits because I already speak right. the languages. Um, okay. Yeah. That's a little bit, yeah, that's, that's a little bit like, um, like my daughter already speaks a little bit of German. So, you know, that's, that's why she picked German in high school. <laughs> yeah. I guess. You kind of have a leg up for sure. Hi, it's been really interesting having this chat with you. It's been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been a real ep uh, ed education and and uh, I think everybody listening to this has th there's so many different things to take away from uh, from what you've what you've told us uh, it's been absolutely fantastic thank you very much for being on the show I appreciate it Kristen thanks for having me thank you so much for listening to this episode if you enjoyed it please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great content but before you go let me just uh, share a quick insight from behavior science when you engage with content you enjoy, you not only make the creator's day, but you also trigger a positive emotion in yourself. It's a small action that can make a big difference in how you feel. So by liking, commenting, or sharing this video, you're not only supporting us, but you're also benefiting yourself. It's a win-win situation. If you enjoyed this episode, let me recommend another episode that I think you'll love. Check out episode 56 with Joel Grimes. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, We'd love to hear it. Your comments are incredibly valuable to us and help us improve our content. So please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Remember to hit the like button, ring that bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye.